12.05, that means it's Bible Live. It's Thursday, of course, and today is episode 90. This is 9-0, the 90th episode of Bible Live. I'm here with Tom Lowe and Nick Pusno. Nick, we'll hear from you in just a moment, but let me just give you a flavour of what's coming up. The question we're asking ourselves is, am I worshipping an idol, and how would I even know? What even is idolatry? I guess my, we might have heard of the word, we might have heard that it's pretty frowned upon in Scripture, idolatry, that idea... What is it, though? What is it in the first place? Why is it so frowned upon? And how would I spot it in my own life and in my own heart? That is our Bible Live discussion <coughs> today. We'll be looking in a moment at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But first, let's say hello to Nick. Nick, you've been on Bible Live before, hello, right? Mike. Hi, Tom. I have you, once, yeah. You um, have been on here once before. I was in Cambridge, yeah, once, yeah. Get what's happened since you were last on Bible Live? Have you done anything in the in between times? Uh, I was in Cambridge. Um, I got ordained, ordained as a deacon in October, and I'm studying my curacy at St Michael's, Westcliff. Yeah. Yay! And Tom is my boss. <laughs> mm. <laughs> he's a hard taskmaster. He used to be my boss. Yeah, he's Bruce with that guy. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> you guys and uh, you suffered much long suffer i'm testing your fruit of the spirit and your long suffering <laughs> <laughs> and uh you have two girls that's yeah, right two little it? ones she's turning seven in, in a few weeks and the other one's four yeah so are you ramping up a big birthday party for that or is it just keeping it on the dl no we just got we're just going to um um like a jump giant base jump oh yeah, yeah nice Keep it simple, you know. There's things to do. Just let the kids go wild, and we just. <laughs> they do. Um, <laughs> they do foot long hot dogs there. Sounds like something I will be enjoying. <laughs> Tasty. Right. Good to see you, Tom. <clears throat> Tom, do you want to read yeah. the scriptures for us? It's good to get a different voice. Yep, we're in one Corinthians ten. And I think we're going to read from 1 to 13, though we might have to dip elsewhere from time to time, but it's an exciting passage. So let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. Here we go. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, and were written down as warnings for us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we're kind of honing in on, I guess, particularly verse 6 and 7 there. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. Let's um, just start out by trying to get a handle. Um, Tom, maybe you can help us out on this initially. Uh, when the Bible talks about idolatry, what do, we th what do we need to be thinking about? What are the stories that come to mind? Where do we need to go to in order to understand even what that word means in biblical terms? Yeah, um, well, I think these are, I mean, some of the uh, examples that Paul mentions here are great examples of what idolatry is. Um, the people of God, they know which is their Lord and Saviour. Um, in this example, Paul, Paul specifically mentions Christ. Christ delivers them from Egypt. He is the Lord their God. He shows them and demonstrates his love for them. Um, he rescues them. He performs many miracles and provides for them in amazing ways. 
but quickly we see the nature of the fallen human heart, which we all have. Um, it's we might be like in one breath we say yes, yes, Lord, you're so wonderful. We know we should worship you, but our sinful natures and our hearts quickly um, turn away from Him, turn away from Him. And Paul uses the word later on in verse 22 about uh, the Lord being jealous. So I think it's you, you could liken it to like a, a you know like a marriage type relationship. The, the Lord talks about that that Israel being His bride, His people, His beloved. And when she uh, spurns his love and is not grateful to him for what he's done and providing and etc., and turns to another idol or another god, um, it's almost like uh, cheating on him. It's that kind of feeling to the Lord. So I think idolatry and that's why idolatry and sexual morality always go sort of really hand in hand in the Bible because it's about um, it's about for want of a better expression, like sleeping around. It's like it's like not being faithful to the Lord. And that's what idolatry is all about um, and and actually leads to disaster. It's not just about God being, hey, how dare you? I'm upset. It's actually also extremely detrimental and damaging to the people he loves. Mm. Nick, take us, just give us an example, maybe somewhere from... Um, God's ancient people uh, in the Old Testament, perhaps, where, you know, some classic examples of idolatry that come to mind just to help us get a bit of a, a yeah. steer here. Uh, I mean, I mean, a classic example was the golden calf, wasn't it? Um, Moses goes up to the, to the mountain to meet the Lord. And by the time he comes back down, <laughs> the Israelites, the Aaron, you know, created this golden calf that they worshipped this, 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 this stain that they built out of gold. And, and they, um, and they, they kind of say it's all because of you that this thing, the golden calf, that we can set free. So, you know, um, God's ancient people, Israel, they've witnessed God taking them out of Egypt. They've, they've witnessed God in power. You know, but yet, like Tom said, you know, in the same breath, you can say, you are Lord. And the second later, they're so fickle and, and they change their hearts and, and they worship this man-made calf. You know, it's, uh, mm. yeah, it's an easy switch, I think. <laughs> It is amazing, mm. and it's always so amazing in that story, particularly how <clears throat> the scale of their rescue, it was so huge that they'd just been brought out of slavery in Egypt. Like, just the scale of that operation, and then the short amount of time, the tiny length of time, mm. Moses goes up the mountain to meet with the Lord. They can't even wait a matter of several weeks before they're prostrating yeah. themselves before a golden calf and worshipping that as if it were the God that brought them out of Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. Great, great one. Tom, there's others. I don't know if you want to <coughs> highlight There's plenty. Any I, mean, I, mean, I mean, Paul mentions a couple more here about um, that they committed sexual immorality and 23,000 of them died in verse 8. He's referring to uh, an episode in Numbers, I think, 25, where what happens is uh, uh, the Israelites have been battling a, a foreign nation. and uh, But what happens in the end is that the, the men desire to 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 sleep with some of the women from these other nations who worship other gods and and as part of that desire they um end up worshiping the gods of of those uh foreign women mm. and 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 obviously end up getting in, getting deeper and deeper into that so i think the interesting lesson from that one isn't it wasn't that they set off to go oh yeah you know christ or lord we we love you lots but we kind of want to get you know we quite like bale of peor or or Kemesh, the god of the Amorites and that sort of thing. It actually happens through their desire for evil things, as Paul says here. He says, do not be idolaters as some of them were as it's written. Or it says, um, no, wait, sorry, verse 6. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we get ensnared into idolatry just by the temptations that we have in life that appeal to us to provide something that our flesh or whatever our heart wants and we think oh if i just had that my life would be much happier if i just could pursue that and we pour energy and and before we know it we've disobeyed the lord and got ensnared into potential idolatry we may not know or think that's what we're getting into uh, but often it, we become enslaved to something. And that is such a common experience for many of us, uh, many, many people who find their lives 
enslaved by something that they didn't intend to set off in that direction. They, they dabbled in it or thought that this is going to provide something I need. Before you know it, you've either got addicted to it or you've given yourself to it and it ends up taking, you end up sacrificing enormous things amount to it and it ends up taking everything from you. So you could you could quickly see how many things can become idolatrous. We didn't set out to worship a, a demon or a foreign god, but the thing that we were tempted, and that's why Paul talks about temptation, this no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. He's like, this is everywhere. It's everywhere for the people of God in the Old Testament. Um, you know, whether it's they were hungry, so they thought, oh, goodness, you know, we need we need to provide for ourselves or we need to look for a, a God that will provide for us. Um, it hap- it's common to. So I think that's the thing to look to is that none of us really might intend to become idolatrous mm. or even know that we are. But um, when 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 the masks are taken off and everything is seen for what it is, we might realize, oh, my goodness, I've worshipped many gods in my life and, and provoke the Lord to anger. Mm. Is, I mean, is there something in the fact that we as humans, that there seems to be almost this built-in desire, uh, a leaning towards, we want to worship something. There's a, there's a, it's almost like this innate capacity. We, we, we want to fix our affections, our worship, our desires on something. Uh, it seems to be the case, in, you know, like you're saying, Tom, that that's happening a lot, whether it was happening way back then or in Paul's day or in our day, that, that you know, that... There's something that's calling us outward, out from ourselves to worship something. There's something good about that, right, Nick? Can you, Nick? Can you relate to that? Yeah, I think, I think, I think you know, we are relational beings, so we are all made to be in relationship with the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We are created beings, like He is, to be in community, and so it's only normal that we, in a, in us, this building thing that we want to be, love, and we want to give love, and we want to 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 be not worship, but we want to be. In, in, in relationship with something or someone, um, and that is can be quite easy, easily distorted actually to 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 worshiping God. We we worship things that think give us pleasure or, or temporal satisfaction. But actually, um, God is the only one you know, who can give us those desires that that mm-hmm. innate longing that you know, the need to be satisfied only can we get that from the Lord. You know, mm-hmm. um, and it's easy mm-hmm. to to find those other things in. In things around us, in our worldly goods, you know, it's um, it's an easy thing to do. Um, mm. But now, mm. these days, yeah, you know, you have good. access to everything on your phone. It's completely easy to access uh, anything. Can be idolatrous in that sense. It's, it's too easy, isn't it? Yeah, built for relationship, built for worship. <clears throat> seem to have that sort of that hankering after it. I remember um, you might be able to. You might have your own experience of this, but I remember going to a Coldplay concert some years ago now, and um, it it felt like a church service in many ways. Um, it was, they obviously sing very emotive songs, you know, they bring up quite a lot of things, but um, it was hands in the air, there was people crying. It was more than just, we're enjoying this music. It felt a lot stronger than, we're just enjoying this music and this is a great event. It felt like we're longing for something here. There's you really there's something powerful in the room, and I want to sort of give myself to something there. It felt quite strange at the time being a part of that. Um, mm. Tom, you might have you had your own experiences of that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. And and on one level, we might your your example of Coldplay concert is an interesting one. You know, on one level, you might go, "Oh my goodness, this is this is." it could easily turn into idolatry. It's almost looking to these band members to answer their life's problems. But it, but equally, it might not turn into idolatry. It might just be actually, no, God has given created things like music mm. and, uh, and crowds and events to stir up a- and feed our souls in certain ways. So the real question is really is finding the right food to satisfy the right hunger, if you see what I mean. So so, so Paul talks earlier about food, literally bread and, and meat and things. And he talks about, look, food for the stomach and stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. So what he's trying to say is, is like, well, look, we have, as Nick rightly pointed out, we have desires. Or you could look at it as we have hungers. We have hungers that need to be satisfied. So, you know, you eat, uh, you eat some bread to fill your hunger. 
The problem is, is if you start to look to food to satisfy a deeper hunger that you have, then it becomes a problem. It can become an idol because it's not designed to satisfy that deeper hunger. So you might go to a Coldplay concert because you have a hunger for um, joy and emotion and things, and it satisfies that. <clears throat> the problem is, is when it becomes, it's trying to, that it's designed to satisfy a particular hunger that you, you God has given you as a created human being, but it, you're looking for it more, and it become it can't satisfy that thing. So, so I think if you go back to the first commandment, or or, or when Jesus talks about the, the two most important commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Get that right. Get your first love right. And then you can love others. You can love people. You can love life. You can love food. You can love, you know, in its proper place. It's when the your love, when your priorities and your loves get in the wrong order that you're in danger of idolatry because it's, you're, you're turning to a created thing to satisfy something that ultimately only the Lord can do. And it doesn't, it's not made for that. It wasn't created for that. It can't do it. It can't deliver. And the more you look to it to satisfy something, the worse the hunger will get. And it will, it will give ever diminishing returns until it destroys you, which is the nature of idolatry. And demons love that kind of stuff. The, the enemy, the enemy loves that kind of stuff. The devil loves that kind of stuff. He'll do anything to get you into anything as long as it's not Jesus putting him first. So whatever it is, he'll try and distract you. He'll give it to you. Even good things. It doesn't, you know, it's not just that everything is demonic and uh, he's going to get you into Satan worship. He, he could get you into almost anything as long as it, you're looking to it to deliver more than it was ever created to give to you. Mm. Um, so you could say loads of ancient people worship the sun in the sky. Yeah. Uh, and you can see why. It is a, it's got an enormous potential for giving life, hasn't it, the sun? In fact, virtually all life on Earth is given by the sun, biological life in a way, isn't it? The light it gives off. You can see why people worshipped it. But ultimately, it is designed to give a certain kind of life, but not eternal life, not the true life, the true light, the uncreated light that we were made for, isn't it? rightly pointed out it can't give you that so no matter how much you worship it it will give you some things but ultimately you'll it'll get worse and worse your hunger for the true light um mm. so i think it's about order as much as it is about um as about you know choosing which god you like best mm. sort of thing <laughs> mm. Mm. although it can be that nick there was in the it's the with the Often when we think of Old Testament stories about idolatry, we're, we're thinking about um, people carving little idols out of wood or a metal worker creating a little sort of figurine or something, and then they choose to worship it. It all seems quite primitive. Um, we might look back and say that's ridiculous. Um, but are those instincts still around? I mean, are we... Uh, uh, you know, I mean, maybe people are still making and building <coughs> idols. They may well be. Um, maybe we yeah. don't see so much of that, but I mean, I mean, it's you know, it's not as primitive as it used to be. But I think I remember someone. So, like for Lent, I gave up, you know, social media. You know, it's an easy one, I think. And how easy is it that we wake up in the morning and go straight onto our phones? The first thing on our left, you know, we don't even say hi to our spouse or wife. We just go turn around, get the phone, start to scroll. You know, it's 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 one of those things I, I saw in my own life that was too easy to do. Um, and it's, I'm not carving out anything at word, but it's so it's just there, you know, it's accessible in my in my hand. Um, but I, I don't think we're necessarily carving things out of wood, but there are things in life that I believe for me anyways, if they if they start to consume your every thought, your every desires, your the need to for, for it to, uh, and if you find your joy, your fulfillment in it, I think then they can become uh, like an idol. Um, if, if if they become your thing where you, you you may get angry if you don't if you're not having what your friend has on, on social media if you look at your friend and he's you know, living his best life whatever and you think oh i really want that i really want what you have i oh man i, I want to go on the holiday i really oh, i like your trainers whatever you know when you start to to want or covet what that person has and then you go to this you go to this lens to achieve what that person has i think then you're on the wrong road my friend <laughs> 
Mm. Yeah. And yeah. I guess you're, I guess it's that sort of, um, even though we might be doing this with things like phones or technology or other things, they're still created things. Um, yeah. I mean, that's one of the lines in Paul's uh, Letter to the Romans, right, Tom? I don't know if that's a helpful distinction. Like, this. <coughs> we're dealing with either the creator or we're dealing with created things and it's when we're dealing with those created things whether we're making them out of whittling a piece of wood (laughs) or it's actually something quite advanced and technological or well thought through Um, yeah it's really interesting because paul talks about um an an idol is nothing he says it back in 1 corinthians 8 verse 4 he says so then about eating food sacrificed to idols idols we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and there is no god but one so he he the Bible often does this in the Old Testament as well. It talks about a wooden statue, an idol. You know, I, I love that one about Dagon. Uh, do you remember that story of Dagon where, uh, oh, who is it? Who's the, what, is it Naaman? I can't remember who the story was. Yeah, it's the Philistines. It's 1 Samuel. It's where uh, they take uh, the it. Ark of the Lord. Yeah, to the Philistines. That's it. And then Dagon's set up in his temple and they and he keeps the Lord keeps knocking him over and they keep sort of repairing him and putting him back Then his head rolls off and this sort of thing. And it's so funny, isn't it? But um, like, and that we we, and yet we treat them as like, oh my, that's a god. You're like, it can't move, it can't speak. You've got to feed it. You've got to like, <laughs> you've got to put, you know, or pretend to feed it like it's this doll. And the Lord's like laughs at. It. He's like, <clears throat> you know, I know the I know the the blacksmith who fashioned that, and he made also a toilet seat out of the rest of the mess. Or you're like, <laughs> you know, and um, the Lord laughs at. It. It's quite funny some of the chapters on that. And yet, of course, in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is also going to say that <clears throat> although it's nothing, and so if you ate a bit of food that was left for that idol, it doesn't matter because it's all made by the Lord. It's a bit of metal and that's a bit of food, no problem. But if you end up um, um, getting engaged in the celebration and the worship that surrounded that, then there are spiritual powers that are potentially behind what that piece of wood represents does that make sense mm. uh, so there's a, there could be a whole culture a whole uh, religion a whole uh, uh, spiritual being or power behind the cult of that work of that idol does that make sense so th- mm. so you can end up participating in the worship and, and fellowship w- of created angels or demons or whatever's behind it um, that's so there's a mixture that we shouldn't revere idols as if they're these magical things they're not it's a bit of wood and uh you know you can knock it over and it's not no nothing's going to happen to you but if you engage in let's say someone says no we're going to have a dinner party where this idol's at the middle of it and then we're going to engage in this kind of practice um that it is a way or, of celebrating or honoring this this god then you can easily get into um that pagan uh, into participation in, in idolatry on that Mm. um and uh yeah are we into making these um idols anymore it, and you know we might laugh at it and look at it as primitive <clears throat> you know nick's got an interesting point about um branding you know a lot of companies will put a lot into branding won't they you know what's your what's the image that represents this much wider culture or belief system i don't know that we that we have maybe there's something in that that we do still look to icons don't we We still look to whether it's a person, this is the epitome of uh, the God of beauty or whatever. This is the epitome of it. And if we find the one that looks the most like that, we can use them as the representative of this um, belief system. You know, and and many celebrities aspire to that or people aspire to that. You could be the face of this thing that you're nothing. You're just a person, but it represents a whole lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. um that comes with it just, uh, just on just while you make me think of material things there <coughs> tom d- it did just bring to my mind um god's ancient peoples did have material things so they had the ark of the covenant for example they had the tabernacle and the temple they had material things that they prostrated themselves uh, uh, you know prayed towards um but what stopped them? I mean, what's the difference? Because because uh, the reason I ask is because people might look at things in churches, for example, particularly the period of Reformation. There was this whole sort of stripping away of churches, stained glass and uh, um, 
uh, icons and you know carvings in the wood and all that kind of thing the, the idea is we've got to strip all that away because we're in danger of idolatry here or we're in danger of worshiping created things rather than the creator yeah do you want to just speak into that a little bit do you want me to or nick do you want to have a go what, what are you yeah, you can go for it mate <laughs> uh yeah i i definitely think that is the case um it's been a fine line sometimes the church has walked on this one i think um and and it often depends on on <clears throat> your heart what do you what do you think you're doing as well um so i i think in the reformation um it could you know we we are pro obviously god does give us physical things to help us in our worship and in the old testament the ark of the covenant absolutely right passover is a very physical thing meals all sorts of and, and even today we still do we've got communion we've got baptism we've got water we do things um and and the church has been tempted in the past to venerate these things or um, preserve them as relics in a way that could be adored or or somehow um, is imbibed with a power of god's presence uh in it so it should be a holy object kind of thing and that can the danger of that, of course, is that then, of course, it becomes literally venerated, doesn't it? We, we almost bow down to it. And I think we, you know, the, the is it the second commandment? You shall not make a, a graven image in my likeness. We could get in danger of that. But I'm also a big fan. I don't think we should only worship in a completely white and blank room because we're in danger of, uh, of, of breaking the, of idolatry. Because I think art, and I even think it's okay to draw pictures of Jesus <clears> and artwork that celebrates him and, and and carvings of angels and all those things are wonderful because they because god has made a world that reflects his image you know in in all sorts of things we see and are helpful for worship it's just we, as long as we don't um worship the actual object so even if you had a picture of jesus he's like that's really helpful i love it, it helps me inspires me and points towards the jesus but if i started bowing down to it and thinking that it is Jesus somehow, or his presence is magically in there, that's where I, we're in danger of idolatry. Mm. Yeah, it's a good distinction because it does. It's come up for it does come up in churches quite a lot as to whether where things should be, should they be. We, for example, have a, a drum kit. That, I mean, in, in our church, uh, usually. Are you worshiping a drum kit <laughs> in church architecture? You would usually look straight down the church, and you would and you would see the table, the communion table at the top mm -hmm. of the church, almost as like a uh, like a visible representation of um, uh, the the meal, Holy Communion, and where we sort of meet with Jesus in the bread and the wine. Uh, but of course, at St John's at the moment, we have a massive <laughs> we have a massive drum kit that's kind of front and center, and lots of questions have been asked about that. Yeah, genuine questions like, but you've moved that into the middle. Um, you know, does that say that says quite a lot about the focus, the center, the sort of what's in the middle, what's in your gaze as you come to worship? I take I do take that point. And um, we've now we've now got it on a platform. We can move it around a little bit more easily. But uh, do you I mean, do you, Nick, have you been in churches? Yeah. Have you have you thought those things through before? Yeah, I think I think I I kind of like what Tom said about, you know, all these sort of um, these, these icons or the paintings or the artwork they are they are there to help us look to jesus so they they are beautiful so we can think about the beauty of jesus they you know nature we can think about the creating order the beauty of what god does you know um but i think it's when we become so hung up on these things and 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 and, and that they need to be in place or else well we're doing something wrong and i think we've lost the focus and it's not about jesus anymore it's becoming religious it rules and regulations well if we don't have it here we're not doing it right if we don't have this cup or this chalice or this thing you know we're, we're doing something wrong and it becomes about rules regulations but then actually we're doing this act well like say holy communion for example we're doing this act because we want to partake in this in this action that jesus taught us to do two thousand plus years ago um so i think we need to be quite careful how we tread in terms of uh, uh, you know, paintings, relics, statues, whatever in the church. Um, what is our focus? Where, where are our eyes? Are they on the, on them? Are we worshiping the, you know, the relics? Or are we using them to aid us in the worship of God? Are, we, are they yeah. pointing to, to, to Jesus? Are they pointing to, to him, the creator, not the created thing? 
And that's so helpful. Is that is it helping? <clears throat> like say then, is it helping us? Because I think Paul's whole sweep of his argument in these chapters is don't do anything that's going to be a stumbling block. You know, if if loads of people are starting to get walking in our church and it's a massive stumbling block that I don't know, you've got a statue of this and a statue of that, or you've got a drum kit there, and you know. The, the first thing we do is not just sort of say, how dare you, we're doing something absolutely right, it's confined and da 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 Our first thing is like, okay, <clears throat> should we consider changing that because it's a stumbling block for certain percentage of the congregation or whatever it is? And actually, we would rather just remove the stumbling block and then maybe we'll get to a place later that we've matured and we can understand these things again. So I think it, Paul's always about, look, if I'm eating food, I'm, if I'm down the temple eating food at some uh, foreign god and, and I'm okay with that because I'm eating the food and I can praise Jesus and do it, but someone else sees me do it and they think that I'm worshipping another god and then they do it and blah, 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 blah. You know, he's just saying, I'll just give it up. That's all right. You know, so I think that there's that question to ask as well. Is like, what is helpful for what, helping us point it to Jesus and what's become unhelpful? Um, and it depends on the context you're in. You've got to understand, you know, Paul says, if I'm with Jewish people or if I'm with Greek mm. people, there'll be different kinds of stumbling blocks. <laughs> um, so I, Paul's free, but he's going to ask, he's going to ask himself that might, I'm not, I, I don't think this is idolatrous, but that person does. Um, and I can see why. So I'm going to leave it. I'm in this different context where this is a real problem. And that does happen in, all the time, doesn't it? Definitely. One, one more question here in the comments, if I could uh, do this, and then we'll sort of draw this to a close. Um, quite good, quite a nice idea here. A good, good thing to chew on. Can um, children, our own children, become? We invest so heavily in them. Perhaps we think of them as being our salvation in some way. Um, <coughs> this next generation of uh, coming from us are our hope and our future. Are we in danger even there of making an idol, gentlemen? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, definitely. Uh, um, of course they can, and we and we all know it when we see it as well. When uh, you know, someone might even say, consider maybe their marriage <clears throat> isn't going so well, and they might think, oh gosh, this isn't good. Maybe a child having a child might save the marriage, or. Mm or I'm really unhappy in life and I'm really lonely, maybe a child will sort that out. And straight away you're putting a burden on that child uh, that they cannot carry. And uh, yeah. and that's what an idol is, is us worshiping, looking to something that it wasn't made to deliver. Mm. And, and, and actually it will become an unhealthy relationship because rather than you giving the child love you're looking or primarily looking for the child to give you love um nothing you know it's understandable and children do give you love and it's very rewarding etc but can yeah. can it uh, so 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 can your spouse become an idol um the family yeah. become an idol all sorts of things yeah in fact I, I do sometimes i wonder whether actually this is the reason why god is so particular about idolatry because if we do reject God at the center of everything, and he's first and foremost in our priority and the center of our worship, if we reject that, then something else will have to step up into its place. And it will probably be our spouse or it will probably be our children. And then you are putting such a high and heavy burden on someone else to be so fulfilling um, in your life that that is really, really dangerous. I mean, that that, that feels too much it feels to quite dangerous to put yeah. such high expectations on another person to and when and then ultimately when it's gone y your life utterly crumbles um yeah. and you've got nothing left which which happens doesn't it um children leave home you know and you yeah. want them to you want them to grow up but some people would rather <clears throat> not have that happen mm. So interesting. Well, Nick, why don't you pray for us? Maybe we can just uh, spend a moment in prayer together and uh, just pray some of these things um, in, help us to, you know, there may be some things we need to just reflect on here and um, let the Lord work. Nick, why don't you pray? Yeah. Jesus, we give you thanks for this day, for the chance to look at your word and, and, and see more of you. And Lord, we pray about um, being idols, 
idols in our lives, Lord. And we just pray that you'll just help us to distinguish uh, where we may uh, have idols in our lives, things that we do, things that we say, things that we hold on to that may uh, stop us from fully knowing you and loving you. Lord, I pray that those who are listening, those who are watching, that you will also help them to discern uh, things in their lives that may um, are taking precedent instead of you, Lord. And with all these things that we've heard, there's so much um, truth, goodness, but also stark warning from Paul. So Lord, uh, give us wisdom to discern these words and look unto our lives to uh, to align our lives to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you, Tom. We're, we're all off to Belshamps now to go and have a look at <coughs> the campsite there. Hope you're coming to Belshamps. Yes. Sign up. If you've not signed up already, get yourself signed up for Belshamps. It's only a month or so away now. I should probably do that, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah fantastic great well thanks so much both um and so for next time let me just highlight what's coming up next time next week uh we are looking at what should i oh actually really really interesting what should i bear in mind when taking communion sacraments we're going to think a bit more um about communion what does it mean when we take bread and wine together what's going on uh, what should we do? How should we approach the Lord's table together when we meet on Sundays? I'm really excited about this one. I think it's going to be an interesting one to think through together. That's next Thursday. But for today, it's goodbye from Nick and Tom. Bye. Bye, everyone. And it's goodbye from me. See you next week.